Yeah, so we moved uh, the Bible study over here because last week it was pretty packed over there in the in the community room. So this this is better. We can spread out, but I don't I don't want us to spread out too much because then we start to lose the Bible study uh, kind of atmosphere. Because uh, if you know, if you've been coming around to New Mountain Church Bible studies, you know you got to talk a little bit. You got to say some stuff, and I always get people going, "Huh? What they say?" You know. So let's not do that. Let's get closer. Uh, so last, uh, last week we looked at a whole bunch of different archaeological uh, evidences, a bunch of things and a bunch of places and a bunch of people, and it was really cool. I kind of was saying it was the, we're going to wet your whistle for biblical archaeology. But then today we're going to look at one specific thing, but really in depth. And it's going to be more of a Bible study today than it was last week. Uh, I figured for the next three weeks we're going to go in depth into certain archaeological digs and how it connects with the Bible. So let's pray and then we can get started with this. I hope you got your Bible verses ready because there's a, quite a few verses to read. So let's, let's uh, pray and then we can start. Lord, we thank you so much for this evening. We thank you for the blessing that you've given us as a place where we can meet and we can learn and we can discuss these biblical archaeological discoveries. I pray, Lord, that you'd bless us in our time together, bless the food that we have, and Lord, uh, we do all of this so that we could learn about you more, learn about your word more, and be connected with you even more. So Lord, I pray that you bless us this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So I'm definitely, definitely looking forward to this one because this one, this one is one of my, one of my favorite biblical archaeology discoveries of all time. And the reason why it's my favorite is because it comes with a really exciting story that we're going to get into. Um, first, let me give a little bit of recap of last week. You know, last week we looked at people. In the Bible, we looked at uh, different people that were mentioned. In fact, we kind of showed this stone. It's the Tel Dan stone, uh, found and uh, written about 900 B.C., but it's, it talks about the house of David. It's archaeological evidence of the fact that King David existed. Uh, we looked at some different places. I think one of this, uh, I think this one is probably my favorite one we looked at last week, and it's Peter's house. And Peter's house is right there in Caesarea, and it's kind of uh, sh- overshadowed by the structure that keeps it from being weathered uh, so that countless generations down the line can see Peter's house. Pretty cool. Uh, we also looked at things last Wednesday. And in fact, we looked at that thing in, in, uh, in particular. And that's the stone that would have kind of symbolized or marked uh, Pontius Pilate's residence in, uh, in Caesarea. So it's pretty cool evidence of biblical characters. But uh, that's not all. We saw Caiaphas's ossuary. Remember, Caiaphas was one of the guys that was judging Jesus. Well, eventually he died because he was a real person. And eventually he was put into a bone box, which is known as an ossuary. Today we're going to look at Hezekiah's tunnel. Hezekiah's tunnel. This is, a, again, a very, very exciting one. Hezekiah's tunnel was found in 1880. And it was cut underground, 643 meters, uh, to cover a distance of about 332 meters to enable the defenders to fetch water within the protective walls during the siege that took place. And this was at the time of King Hezekiah. Uh, this, this tunnel was not just you know, cutting a tunnel through stone. It was much, much more important than that. We, here's another picture of the tunnel and the steps leading down to it. Now, this is the beginning of the well where the water comes out right under those steps and it continues all the way through Hezekiah's tunnel. I think I've got a few more of the pictures leading up to it. Here's David's Jerusalem. This would have been Jerusalem back in the time of David. And you see the Gihon Springs. Now that is where the water comes, right there, that, that's kind of a valley called the Kidron Valley, and it comes out, well, when Hezekiah gained power, he redirected it to go within the walls of Jerusalem. 
right here is a picture of the temple up there at top. And then if you look all the way at the bottom, there's the Pool of Siloam. This drawing depicting the pilgrimage road from the Pool of Siloam to the Temple Mount. That you, you, if you were going to the temple, you had to go down to the pool to wash, uh, to spiritually you know, cleanse yourself. Now here is the picture of uh, kind of an artist's drawing underground of how they cut this tunnel through limestone, leading all the way from the Gihon Spring, um, all the way underneath Jerusalem, and then to the Pool of Siloam. This was the original entrance to the Gihon Spring, which is no longer able to be uh, seen or gone to, because that's in an area that is heavily Arab and Jewish, and there's conflict there, and so you really can't go there anymore. 30 years ago, you would have been able to go onto those steps where it leads down into Hezekiah's tunnel. Now, you go through a different angle going into the tunnel, but you still can go in there. Now, this is the entrance to the Gihon Spring and Hezekiah's tunnel today, and you walk down these steps, and there is actually people that lead people on expeditions through the tunnel. You could pay a fee and actually go with a, a, a guide and they take you through the tunnel. Now the tunnel sometimes gets to where you got to duck down and it gets uh, kind of small and sometimes it opens up wider. But going through this tunnel, you're going and you're going in a single file line. You're just walking right after the next guy and you're going through and you can see the marks of the axe as they're chiseling through the rock. And uh, the water is up to your waist. And this is water that is just coming out of the ground. And it is, it is cool. Uh, I don't know if it's very clean, but it's cool water, I heard. And you walk through this all the way from the Gihon Spring underneath Jerusalem, and you end up at the Siloam Pool. You had a question? Uh, I was going to ask if it still had water coming down the steps. The water comes out from right under the steps. The steps come down, they're cut into rock, and then right at the last step is where the well water comes up out of the ground, and then it flows down Hezekiah's tunnel. Back in the day before Hezekiah, it would have had the steps, and then it would have had the spring, but there would have been no tunnel directing the water. It would have just kind of filled up into a pool. I'll show you in a, in a little bit. This uh, next picture shows uh, Warren's shaft. and So there was an archaeologist named uh, Charles Warren back in the 1800s, and he found this shaft that led down kind of um, on, on, the far, on, the, on the inside portion of the wall and it went down into Hezekiah's tunnel and this archaeologist was saying that this was probably a way that they could have lowered down buckets uh, too hard to say really but 2 Samuel 5 7 through 8 shows us that this Warren's shaft might have been there even back in the time of David so who's got 2 Samuel 5 7 through 8 all right go for it John with your outside voice Nevertheless, David took a stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. And David said on that day, whoever would strike the Jebusites, let him get up in the water shaft into a path. The lame and the blind, who are hated by David's soul, therefore it is said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. So this is David and his men, and David is being mocked by the inhabitants at that time of Jerusalem, the Jebusites, and they were saying, even a blind or a lame can defend this place from you, David, because Jerusalem was a very fortified city. It was extremely hard to break through the walls or to attack them in any way. And so they're essentially mocking David, saying, even our blind and our lame can keep you out. But what happened was David sent a guy up through the, what they call it, a water shaft. So that could be Charles Warren's discovery of the shaft. It could be. It might not be, but it could be. When it comes to um, certain things in archaeology, 
you got to keep in mind that there's a there's a lot of maybes out there. Not everything is a for sure for sure thing. But one thing that is for sure, almost almost no scholars alive today believe that this tunnel is anything other than Hezekiah's tunnel that he had made. If what happened with David and David's man, if David sent his man to go into and infiltrate and take over and conquer the same way we have King Jesus that goes into our old lives and conquers. He becomes king over our life. I love this quote. This is from Redpath. He's an old theologian from back in the day. He says, On the same principle, King Jesus conquers old strongholds when he becomes king over our lives. Territory that should have been given to him long ago is now conquered. I want to say to you, in the name of the Lord Jesus, that there is no habit that has gone so deep, but that the power of the blood of Jesus can go deeper. And there is no entrenchment of sin that has gone so far, but the power of the risen Lord by his Holy Spirit can go further. That is true. That is true. We see, you know, we read through your Old Testament. You see, the, you see, conquered nations, right? You see, uh, you see, King David and his men win these battles, and you think, wow, that's really cool. But it also it, it shows us the fact that Jesus conquers sin on our behalf. It's just really, really cool. So let's keep going. Let's look at this next picture. It says Hezekiah's tunnel brought water into the city of David, connecting the Gihon Spring the Gihon Spring, with a pool of Siloam. So it's underground that this took place. Keep in mind there is no, you know, engineers that are trying to pinpoint exactly where to cut. Uh, There is no, you know, scientists that are working out exactly how they should do it. Uh, I think that this heavily, heavily inspired by the Lord. Now this is the point underground. If you look to the right, you see that big yellow circle that is the meeting point. So what that means is that Hezekiah had two work teams. Two teams of skilled laborers and chiselmen with axes and picks. And they were both underground at the same time working towards a single point. Now what are the odds that they could do that? <laughs> that they could make it? That they can connect well, they did connect, and there was, they, were, they were one foot off. They connected that closely. They were one foot off. And you can see, this is, you can see where the, the edge of the tunnel just seems to be different. In fact, if you were right there, you can see that the chisel marks are going this way on one side and then going this way on the other side. And they meet right there underground. And it's funny, too, because if you look at that blue line, I know it's kind of hard to see, but if you look at that blue line... You notice it's not a straight shot. It's almost like they were just, oh Lord, where should we go, Lord? I'm just going to start swinging, Lord. I hope you're, I'm hoping you're opening up the path for me to go, you know. And, And you can see even right there at their meeting point, they started to turn and they finally, bam, met underground, underneath however many meters of limestone. That's pretty amazing. That is pretty, pretty awesome. So here's another picture. You can see that guy off to the left. This is just two separate pictures of the tunnel. Uh, You can see it's it's different at different places. It looks differently in different places. But the water is up to that guy's waist up there on the tunnel. The picture of the tunnel on the left. Now here's the other end. Here's the other end, uh, you know, within the last 20 years. And this is... The pool of Siloam, you can see the steps going down where people would go down to this pool, right? You go down to this pool, you, you uh, uh, can wash, and a lot of people would be healed down there. In fact, we hear a great story with Jesus. Let's look at John 9, verse 1 through 7. Who's got that? Nancy's got it. As you pass by, you saw a man lying from birth, and his disciples Oh, 
Now, I know that everybody jokes around when they see that Jesus spit in, and made mud with dirt and Jesus spit, you know. Everybody jokes around about it, but if, but if you look real closely in that scripture, by Jesus doing that, that's Jesus anointing that person. Like, with, in, the, in the person of Jesus, his, even his saliva, that's, the, that's a, such a close connection with God. And so this guy's healed by what Jesus done, but now... Jesus tells him to go down to the pool and to wash. And then Nancy said something very funny. She said, which means sent. It said that in Scripture. Which means sent. And that is the, the, the meaning of the name Siloam. It is essentially sent water. Or another way of looking at it would be uh, conducted or aqueduct water. Uh, you could essentially say it was plumbed that way. It was piped that way. So the name of the pool of Shalom is named that because it got piped over there. Even the name of Shalom shows us that it was piped over there. Now, this is cool. This is the location where the Siloam inscription originally was made and the, ins- and the inscription itself on the right. Now, 1800s, as soon as this was found, of course you have... Grave robbers come in and they start chipping things out and trying to sell things. In fact, the Ottoman, do we know who the Ottoman are? Muslims. Came in, chipped it out, sold it off, and it was able to be, it was able to be, um, they found who, who stole it and they were able to find where it was sold and they got it back. And so now it's in, it's in a museum now, uh, but it's an inscription. Now this is the coolest part about it, is that this inscription was not, decreed by King Hezekiah. This inscription was the guys that carved it. Like, like, and I, I, it's funny too, because I mean, I've, I remember working construction for a lot of years of my life, you know, and we'd be up in the top of a, you know, top of some big building on the, on the ledge of a window, you know, and I'm putting in these big windows and we'd just be writing stuff on the window seal, you know. But we're dorks, though. We're writing dumb things. These guys are over here writing the coolest things ever. Because this is what it says in ancient Hebrew. This is what it says. It says, it says, This is the story of the tunnel. While the hewers lifted their axes toward their counterparts, and while three cubits more were to be hewn, was heard the voice of a man calling to his counterpart, For there was a crack in the rock on the right and on the left. And on the day of the final barrier's piercing, the stone cutters struck each man towards his counterpart. Axe against axe. And water flowed from the source to the pool for 120 cubits. And 100 cubits was the height of the rock over the head of the stone cutters. So this is them actually saying that they got to the point where they're calling out, "Hey, hey, can you hear, can you hear them? Can you hear them? I don't know. I can't hear them. Keep cutting. Keep chipping. Keep going. All right. Hey, and then they finally started to hear each other, and then they, they start chipping away, chipping away, and then finally their their tools, their axes or, or or pickaxes came together, and they broke through, and the water was able to flow all the way through. That's awesome that it was them that wrote it, though." That it was the guys that cut through. Now, this would have probably taken quite a bit of time to do this, but it was it was done at a time when Jerusalem was under the threat of attack from the Assyrians, and at any moment the Assyrians could come by and completely stop up the water source to Jerusalem. Now, we don't even get that because we all have wells or we all have city taps, uh, you know, and we can get water whenever we want. And we can go to the water store and put in a quarter and get a whole jug of water. So we don't even get it. But back then, you had to go get your water. You had to go put your pail down into the, into the H2O and pull it up if you wanted to drink that day. What if that was taken from you? This is what they're thinking. So they have these two teams. You notice that 
they had two teams going, meaning like, okay, one team's just not going to cut it. We need two teams working day and night, cutting through this. In fact, I heard a, a Jewish guy say, he says, they were working, they were working 24-6. <laughs> you know, not 24-7, 24-6, Sabbath, Sabbath, we've got to watch out. Yeah. But they were just going for it, just night and day, cutting through it, because they knew that if they failed... They knew that if they got to the point where the invading army comes and they're not ready, their families die. Can you imagine? That would fuel you, wouldn't it, guys? If it was like, well, my family's going to die if I don't get this job done. (laughs) Well, you're probably going to work really hard to get it done, right? I mean, I would be. I would be. So let's jump into the scripture then. Um, Let's jump into this. We're going to go through quite a bit of scripture because this is more of a Bible study than, uh, than a than showing a bunch of pictures like we did last week. But this is going to start off for us in um, 2 Chronicles 28. And I'm going to give the backstory leading up to what happens with Hezekiah. So the backstory of it starts with this, uh, chapter 28 of Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. It says, Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign. Now this is Hezekiah's father. 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as his father David had done. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. He even made metal images of the Baals, and he made offerings in the valley of the son of Hinnom, and burned his sons as an offering, according to the abominations of the nations, whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. And he sacrificed and made offerings on the high places and on the hills and under every green tree. Ahaz, obviously, he starts off as a king of Judah, and he starts off on the wrong foot, and he just lives on that wrong foot. He eventually dies on that wrong foot. Ahaz not only rejected the God of his heritage, but he embraced the ungodly ways of the pagan nations around them, and, and also the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom of Israel has... Had, had at this time had continually had one rotten king after the other. One rotten king after the other that was leading the people into idolatry. The northern kingdom of Israel had only ungodly kings. And uh, Ahaz followed in their path. It shows that they were also offering up their sons in a sacrifice. Now, this is abomination. This is a horrible thing, but it is... Essentially what took place for many of the cultures, and unfortunately for all, also for the Israelites. They were, they were uh, uh, another way to put it is they were letting their sons pass through the fire. That was a way of saying that they were, they were burning their children to the god Molech. Now I've showed the picture before of the, of the ancient god Molech, and how they would portray him as a giant brass bull with his arms out like this. And they would kindle a large fire, almost like a bonfire, right there in the lap of Molech. And the flames would go up past the bronze arms, and they would become red hot. And the, the, the pagans, the idol worshippers, they'd start beating on drums and chanting. And they thought, at a chance for a better life, that they could bring their kids, and they would place their babies on the scolding hot arms of Molech. And their babies would scream and burn, fall into the fire. And this happened all the time. And God is, ooh, God is saying, that is an abomination. That is, that is detestable to me. In fact, Leviticus 20 uh, shows us a little bit of a picture of that. Leviticus 20, 1 through 5. That's Lynn's favorite book in the Bible, <laughs> Leviticus 20. That's the Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, any Israelite or any foreigner residing in Israel who sacrifices any of his children to war is to be put to death. The members of the community are to stone him. I myself will set my face against him and will cut him off from his people. For by sacrificing his children to Moloch, he has defiled my sanctuary. Members of the community close their eyes with that man sacrificing one of his children to Noah. And if they fail to put him to death, I myself will set my face against him and his family, and will cut them off from the people together with all who follow them. They prostituted themselves to Noah. Mm-hmm. 
me and Walt were talking earlier today about um, abortion, and it is scary. It is frightening to think how closely abortion and ancient child sacrifice connect. They are like hand and glove connect. The ancient the ancients would have sacrificed their kids horribly. You know, granted, this is just ruthless and and perverse, detestable. But they would sacrifice their kids to have a better life. You get rid of one kid to have a better life in the future. You fast forward now 2,000, uh, 3,000 years, and it's people today are sacrificing their baby for a better life in the future. So it's very, very scary to see how nothing is new underneath the sun. Okay, Second Chronicles 33.6. Who's got that one? as an offering in the valley of the son of Hinnom, and used fortune-telling and omens and sorcery, and dealt with mediums and with necromancers. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. So we notice that in Second Chronicles it shows us that it was not only child sacrifice, but it was also a whole list of these other detestable things. Fortune telling and medium sorcery, all this, all this um, divination, all this witchcraft. Uh, it seems like that in the last you know twenty years in America, r- witchcraft has taken a popularity turn, right? Or it's, it seems to be very popular now. They even have in the form. No, they don't really. Yes, do. Wow. What do you call a chaplain witch? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a joke. You know, what do you call a chaplain? Uh, anyways, I'm going to read through 2 Chronicles 28, uh, 5 through 6, where it says, Therefore the Lord his God gave him into the hand of the king of Syria, who defeated him and took captive a great number of his people and brought them to Damascus. He was also given into the hand of the king of Israel, who struck him with great force. For Pekah, the son of Remaliah, killed 120,000 from Judah in one day, all of them men of valor, because they had forsaken the Lord, the God of their fathers. So we see, we see that, that Ahaz had not done what was right in the, side, in the eyes of the Lord. In fact, he did detestable things. And it says, verse 5, Therefore the Lord gave him into the hand of the king of Syria. Keep this in mind, because this is a theme that comes all throughout the Old Testament, where a people of God would rise up and love the Lord and follow the Lord, and then there would, there would be the next king or the next person in charge that would lead them into idolatry, and then idolatry would lead them into destruction. And then out of the ashes of destruction would come a remnant that would turn back to the Lord, and their, com- their whole community would thrive, and everything would be, would be working, <laughs> and then eventually it would start to tip again into evil. That's just the overarching theme that happens throughout the Old Testament. And we see right here, even, even uh, Ahaz, he's getting his stuff destroyed. It is turning out very, very rotten for him and for the whole group of Judah at this moment. Okay, the next one, uh, verse 9 through 11, it says, They took captives and were rebuked by the prophet of Israel at the time. It says, But a prophet of the Lord was there whose name was Oded. And he went out there to meet the army that came to Samaria and said to them, Behold, because the Lord, the God of your fathers, was angry with Judah, he gave them into your hand. But you have killed them in a rage that has reached up to heaven. And now you intend to subjugate the people of Judah and Jerusalem, male and female, as their slaves. Have you not sins of your own against the Lord your God? Now hear me and send back the captives from your relatives whom you have taken, for the fierce wrath of the Lord is upon you. That is the scariest part of that section. To have the fierce wrath of the Lord upon you. Because notice what happens. Israel comes in, northern kingdom comes in, and defeats Ahaz, Hezekiah's dad. Defeats him in battle and takes 120,000 people. Kills all sorts of great warriors. And so now they're marching the people of Judah back to Israel. 
And the prophet gets up and says, what are you doing? It, it, it's bad enough that you've, you've killed them in such a manner that you did. It says, the, 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 what he said, the uh, extent of your rage has reached up to heaven. Like, this prophet is saying, okay, the Lord God used you to punish Ahaz and his wicked idolatry. But you went above and beyond in pain and suffering towards them. And then, then you took the, the men and, and the women and the children as captives and then you're bringing them back to Israel. He says, he says, the wrath of the Lord is upon you. Let's skip ahead a little bit. Second Chronicles 28, 25 to 27. In every city of Judah, he made high places to make offerings to other gods, provoking the anger of the Lord, the God of his fathers. Now the rest of his acts and all his ways from first to last, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. That book is lost to us. We don't know that. There's a few books that scripture mentions that have been lost over the ages. It says, verse 27, And Ahaz slept with his fathers. We know what that means? <laughs> Dead. And they buried him in the city in Jerusalem, for they did not bring him into the tombs of the kings of Israel. Now we see Hezekiah. We see Hezekiah come on the scene after Ahaz had done a number on the, king, the kingdom. And Hezekiah, his son, reigned in his place. 2 Chronicles 29, chapter 29, shows us the beginning of Hezekiah now. Hezekiah began to reign when he was 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. Can you remember what you did at, at age 25? Could you have handled the whole kingdom? You were doing stupid stuff? Me too. Me too. Although I've been married to Amy for a year, so that was the least stupid thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> It says that he'd reigned 29 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. There we go. There we go. That's a lot different than his dad, right? His dad did what was wicked in the eyes of the Lord. And now we see Hezekiah doing what's right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, had done. Now this is awesome because the story of Hezekiah is in Second Chronicles, but it's also in Second Kings. So let's look at a piece from Second Kings 18, 4 through 6. Who's got that? He removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden image and broke in pieces. Bronze serpent, the Moses that made. For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nahushtan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord, he did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. I love Hezekiah for a bunch of different reasons, but one of the reasons I love Hezekiah is because when he came on the scene, he said, nah, nah we got a clean house. Pick up your baseball bats, boys. <laughs> we're going into the temples and we're going into all these high places and we're going to remove all this trash that unfortunately my fathers had, had piled up. And I think that's beautiful because I think that whenever a Christian comes to know Jesus Christ and they know things are off in their life, maybe things that have been made, made the norm from their fathers, there's some Christians who don't clean house. And the pain and the struggles and the effects of what their parents have done starts to affect them. That's why I think when you become a Christian, you need to think like, wow, Okay, what in my life is dishonoring God? And then you go into that with a shovel and you take it all out. If it dishonors God, take it out. It don't matter if it's something that your family has been into for generations and generations. You take it all the way out. There's a lot of people that I know that even though they still believe in God, they hold you know, special crystals in their, ha in their houses or they call fortune tellers because they've seen their mom call fortune tellers back in the day. Or any number of things that dishonors God. 
if we don't clean house, if we don't knock down those strongholds, they're going to start to infect our futures. That's why I think Hezekiah, he comes through and he wipes it all clean. Oh, that's, that's good. In fact, <clears throat> there's a old, uh, an old uh, preacher from back in the day. I think he was a uh, Southern Baptist from back in the day. His name was uh, G. Campbell Morgan. But he said, notice, he said, notice that when Hezekiah comes into power, he made no attempt to blame God for the calamities. How many people would have seen like, oh, well, look at what happened to our forefathers and everything was in, in ruins. Everything's been destroyed. Where was God when that all happened? Why would God allow that to happen? You notice Hezekiah, he didn't, he didn't do that at all. He made no attempt to blame God for the calamities which had overtaken the nation. Hezekiah knew why the calamities came. He knew why. He knew he had to fix it. And so he cleans the temple. That's one of the first things he does as he's in power. <coughs> in fact, if we go to uh, verse 5 through 6, we see Hezekiah. He's praying to the Lord and he's making a change. There's going to be a new sheriff in town. And his name's Hezekiah. <laughs> And he, he's going to clean house. And he does. Let's look at 5 through 6. It says this. And he said to them, Hear me, Levites. Now consecrate yourselves and consecrate, consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of your fathers, and carry out the filth from the holy place. For our fathers have been unfaithful and have done what is evil in the sight of the Lord our God. They have forsaken him and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord, and they turned their backs. Hezekiah also restores temple worship. And this is, we're going to skip ahead to verse 30. It says this, And Hezekiah the king and the officials commanded the Levites to sing praises to the Lord with the words of David. What would be the words of David? The Psalms. That's the first time we see ancient psalm singing going on. That's pretty awesome. The words of David and of Asaph, the seer. That's another person that has written a lot in the psalms, Asaph. And they sang praises with gladness, and they bowed down and worshipped. Oh, this is amazing to see that there's, there's worship now. There's the temple cleansed now. Let's go to the next verse, verse 31. Then Hezekiah said, You have now consecrated yourselves to the Lord. Come near, bring sacrifices and thank offerings to the house of the Lord. And the assembly brought sacrifices and thank offerings. And all who were of willing heart brought burnt offerings. They're all starting to bring their offerings to the Lord now. And he doesn't even stop there. And now Passover starts to be celebrated for who knows how long. And this is Second Chronicles 30, 13-15. And many people came together in Jerusalem to keep the feast of unleavened bread. In the second month, a very great assembly. And they set to work and remove the altars that were in Jerusalem. And all the altars for burning incense they took away and they threw into the brook of Kidron. Remember the Kidron Valley and that brook right there is connected to the Gishon Spring that fed Hezekiah's tunnel. Keep that in mind. Verse 15 says, And they slaughtered the Passover lamb on the, first, on the 14th day of the second month, and the priests and the Levites were ashamed. This is, this is great. They were ashamed. So they consecrated themselves and brought burnt offerings into the house of the Lord. Now, I think it's great when people come to a church service and they, they meet Jesus and they give their life to Jesus and they, they pray, maybe even if it's the sinner's prayer, but they, like, they totally turn their life over to Jesus Christ. That's awesome. But you know what's really awesome? When you see pastors that are so burdened by the Lord God that they, they just get onto their knees and they pray and they consecrate themselves before the Lord. That is, that is something deep because unfortunately in this, especially in this American culture that we live in, there's a whole bunch of preachers out there that are the opposite of humble. In fact, they they feel entitled. I, I watched one pastor 
condemn his church because they didn't give him a fancy watch on Pastor Appreciation Sunday. Oh, I don't want to be standing next to that guy when Judgment Day comes. I'll get a sunburn. You know. So. Are you for something? Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, jet, yeah. Just give me a hang glider. I'm good with a hang glider. I can get a lot of places with a hang glider. No, but, but, but these priests, these are the priests of the temple, and even they were convicted. Oh, that's deep. That is really, really deep. That is really deep. They, they, they start bringing their offerings. Let's look at this connect to Luke 22. It'll be really cool to connect to Luke 22, 14 through 20. When the hour came, Jesus So we see that specific moment right there is the last Passover and the first communion that ever took place. The last Passover and the first communion. We, we, when we look at Hezekiah, and he's now cleansed the temple. He's got them worshiping. He's got them bringing the sacrifices. He, he's got even the priests humbled and praying to God. And now he's instituting Passover again. Obviously, if you've been a Christian for two seconds, you might know that uh, the Passover or the, uh, the idea of the, the crossing over the Red Sea of the Israelites had been something that God wanted everybody to remember for generations and generations and generations. And so that's why the Passover was in place. Because every single piece of the, uh, the Passover meal, the Seder meal, had a connection to something that happened during that time, the Israelites coming out of Egypt, crossing the Red Sea, and the Pharaoh, right, hot on their trail, right, and God leading them through the wilderness, it all has a, a tie to the meal that they eat together, this Passover meal. And if you look, if you do a really in-depth Bible study of the foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, the foreshadowing of Jesus Christ is all through the Passover meal. The fact that, that we have that Redeemer, right, that has brought us through, brought us out of corruption, brought us out of sin. And we have the enemy, the devil, uh, hot on our trails, following after us. But as it seems like we in our life get to a point where there's no chance of us surviving, God comes in and saves us, splits the sea, and leads us to victory. And what happens after they get across to the other side of the river? Anybody remember? Anybody remember? They get across, Miriam pulls out a tambourine, right? And praising starts happening. And everybody's singing, right? Until. Yeah, until. Don't, don't, don't ruin the story, Lynn. Don't ruin the story. Yeah. But that all foreshadows Jesus. And so Hezekiah is now uh, getting everybody together, getting the temple worked out, getting everybody on track and he's organizing the priests. And so let's look at 2 Kings 18, 13 through 16. Who's got that? In the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, King Sacharib of Assyria came to attack the fortified cities of Judah and conquer them. King Hezekiah sent this message to the king of Assyria at Black- Blackish. I have done wrong. I will pay whatever tribute money and demand if you will only go away. The king of Assyria then demanded a settlement of more than 11 tons of silver and about one ton of gold. To gather this amount, King Hezekiah used all the silver stored in the temple of the Lord and in the palace treasury. Hezekiah even stripped the gold from the doors of the Lord's temple and from the door place he had overlaid with gold. And he gave it all to the Assyrian. 
So let's keep in mind, Hezekiah's father ruined everything and led everybody into idolatry and the nation was destroyed pretty much. Hezekiah comes back, Hezekiah rebuilds, he takes all the idols away, he puts back uh, the, the Passover, the temple worship, the priests, he's making everything right, and then attack. Oh man, doesn't that sound exactly like the Christian life? Like, oh, give my life to Jesus. And I start going to church, and I'm, I'm praying at nighttime. I'm kneeling down, I'm praying, and I'm talking to God, and I'm, I'm reading my Bible, I'm reading my Bible a lot. I'm even understanding some of it. <laughs> and, and it seems like your life is really going, going good, and you've, you've clicked into a, a new gear, and, and you're starting to operate uh, in, in a life lived for the Lord. And you're like, wow, the mornings are bright. I hear birds chirping, and I don't want to shoot them. Like... This is great. I love being a Christian. And then what happens? Something happens. The enemy starts to attack. Right? That's the norm. That's the norm. In fact, I think once you become a Christian, you should probably... I think we should do this as a church. We should make these shirts that just have a bullseye on the back. Because once you become a Christian, you need to go ahead and put on the bullseye shirt. Because somebody's coming for you. Right? But... Good news is the enemy's coming for you, but we have a Savior that is protecting us. Right? Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to withstand the fiery darts of the enemy. But the bullseye is there nonetheless because we get attacked. We get attacked. Second Chronicles, what was it? It's because it's spiritual warfare. Definitely. Definitely. So I'm going to read through... Uh, chapter 32, because this is the main scene that I want us to show, or I want us to look at for today. And we're already late. Oh, man, I'm going to throw my watch away. I don't want this, I don't want this thing anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that, that one got lost in the mail, man. So I'm still waiting for that one. <laughs> okay, I'm going to hurry, I'm going to hurry. Okay, verse uh, 1 of chapter 32 of Second Chronicles. After these things and these acts of faithfulness, uh, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and invaded Jerusalem and encamped against the fortified cities, thinking to win them for himself. And when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come and intended to fight against Israel, he planned with his officers and with his mighty men to stop the water of the springs that were outside the city. And they helped him. And a great many people were gathered, and they stopped all the springs and the brook that flowed through the land, saying, Why should the kings of Assyria come to find water? And he set to work resolutely and built up the wall that was broken down and raised towers upon it. And outside he built another wall, and he strengthened the Milo in the city of David. He also made weapons and shields in abundance, and he set combat commanders over the people and gathered them together to him in the square at the gate of the city and spoke encouragingly to them, saying, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or dismayed before the king of Assyria and all the horde that is with him, for they are more with us than with him. There is more with us than with him. With us, or sorry, with him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us to fight our battles. And the king took confidence from the words, or sorry, and the people took confidence from the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. So Hezekiah has already tried to pay the Assyrians to leave, right? He tried to save his kingdom that way. Let me just pay them off, get them out of here. Maybe they'll just leave if they get enough gold and silver. Nope. The Assyrians have encamped all the way around it now. And they're wanting to kill. They're wanting to enslave. They're wanting to conquer. And so Hezekiah gets his people together. Be strong and courageous. Where else in the Bible do you hear that? Joshua, Joshua 1.9. Be strong and courageous. He says, do not be dismayed. He says that we have the Lord our God fighting our battles. Let's keep going. Now we see Sennacherib blaspheme. It says, verse 9, after this, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, who was besieging Lachish with his forces, sent his servants to Jerusalem, to Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all the people of 
Judah who were in Jerusalem, saying, Thus says Sennacherib, king of Assyria. And I got a picture, I think. So that's Sennacherib coming around. That's an ancient portrait of him. Now he's encamped around the city. All his men with shields and spears and swords. And he's making orders now. They're going all the way around just ready for battle. And then they send this guy. And that's who we're reading about now. It says this. Thus says Sennacherib, king of Assyria, On what are you trusting that you endure the siege in Jerusalem? Is not Hezekiah misleading you that, you that he may give you over to die by famine and by thirst when he tells you the Lord our God will deliver you from the hands of, king, of, the, of the king of Assyria? Has not this same Hezekiah taken away his high places and his altars and commanded Judah and Jerusalem? Before one altar you shall worship, and on it you shall burn your sacrifices. Do you not know what I and my fathers have done to all the peoples of other lands? Were the gods of the nations of those lands at all able to deliver the lands out of my hand? Who among all the gods of those nations that my father devoted to destruction was able to deliver his people from my hand? That your God should be able to deliver you from my hand? Now therefore, do not let Hezekiah deceive you or mislead you in this fashion. And do not believe him, for no God of any nation or kingdom has been able to deliver his people from my hand or from the hand of my father's. How much less will your God deliver you out of my hand? This guy is riding around the wall, just yelling out, screaming out, Don't trust Hezekiah. You think your God's going to save you? He's, he's instituting right here psychological warfare. right? Let's bring down the morale of the people. Let's get them questioning and uh, let's turn them against their king. Let's get them to even think twice about their God. The psychological warfare that this guy's doing. Verse 16, And his servants said still more against the Lord God and against his servant Hezekiah. And he wrote letters to cast contempt on the Lord the Lord God of Israel, and to speak against him, saying, Like the gods of the nations of the lands who have not delivered their people from my hand, so the God of Hezekiah will not deliver his people from my hand. Now he's sending letters. First he's yelling it across the wall. Now he's sending letters. And they shouted it with a loud voice in the language of Judah to the people of Jerusalem who were on the wall to frighten and terrify them in order that they might might take the city. And they spoke of the, of the God of Jerusalem as they spoke of gods of the other people of the earth, which are the work of men's hands. Hmm. Now the Lord delivers Jerusalem. Let's see, verse 20. Then Hezekiah the king and Isaiah the prophet. I don't know if I put a picture of them. I didn't. So now Isaiah comes to, to uh, Hezekiah. And he says, they prayed because of this and cried to heaven. And the Lord sent an angel. Notice that Isaiah, prophet Isaiah, comes now to Hezekiah. And they both pray. They both humble themselves, get down. They pray to God for deliverance. They pray to God to come to their rescue. And what happens? Let's look. Verse 21. And the Lord sent an angel who cut off all the mighty warriors and commanders and officers in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned with shame of face to his own land. That's, that means that Sennacherib now returns with shame to his own land. And when he came into the house of, uh, uh, of his gods, some of his own sons struck him down there with the sword. So the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and from the hands of all his enemies, and provided for them on every side. And many brought gifts to the Lord to Jerusalem 
and precious things to Hezekiah, king of Judah, so that he was exalted in the sight of all nations from that time onward. This is where we're going to come to the end because now the reason that they were able to stay alive was because of that tunnel. So who's got 2 Kings 19.35? Uh huh. Now there's a bunch of different ideas from different theologians. Some say that it was it was done by the Lord by an angel, but that the angel used a specific uh, a specific strain of dysentery that killed all the soldiers within three days. Um, me, I would rather just take the Bible as, as it says that the angel of the Lord came through. And with pinpoint accuracy, murdered all those, or killed all those uh, enemy soldiers. You know, we th- sometimes we can look and look at life and see like, oh, there is no way around this. I'm not getting through this. And then we just see the Lord work it out. Right? The Lord, remember, the Lord fights the battles. That's what Hezekiah promised in the beginning. The Lord, the Lord's going to fight the battle. Okay, Hosea one seven. Who's got that one? Nice. Oh, you got it? Yeah. Who's got it? Oh, Jair's got it. <laughs> but I will have mercy on the house of Judah, and I will save them by the Lord, their God. I will not save them by, by bow or by sword, or by war, or by horse, or by horsemen. The Lord is the Savior. The Lord is the one who brought the deliverance for them. Very true, very true. Now, as Sennacherib comes back home... Notice, he's coming back to the Assyrians, who are brutal people. Like, we... we, we I'm wanting to go through the, the book of Jonah the next in church. You know, we're, we're going to finish up the book of Luke here in the next month or so. <laughs> Why are you laughing at that? Okay, maybe two months. Maybe two months. Yeah. But, but uh, in, the, in the book of Jonah, remember, Jonah does not want to go to the Ninevites, remember? Okay, the Ninevites are Assyrians. So, like, Assyrians are, are brutal people. They're brutal people. And uh, there is brutality that even comes upon the head of Sennacherib. Because as he comes back, notice he's coming back, and he's coming back as a failure. It didn't work. It didn't happen. So, so who do you think kills him? It's his sons. His sons kill him. His sons, as he comes back to the kingdom, he's not coming back as a conquering warlord. And so they kill him out of shame. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Let me see if I have this. This is a, a great uh, quote from Poole, another theologian. It says, God spared Sennacherib not in mercy, but in wrath. Whew. Sometimes when we feel like we've got out, right, we've got, what is that saying? We got out of the frying pan into the fire, right? That's, that's what happened to Sinetra. Reserving him a more dreadful and shameful death by the hands of his own children. Wow. You got Second Kings 20, verse 20? Yes. All right, you, uh, read it loud. The rest of the events in Hezekiah's region break. Break, break, break. Rain included the extent of his power and how he built a pool and dug a tunnel to bring the water into the city are recorded in the book of history of the, king, of the kings of Judah. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Wow, that is an amazing thing to see this, this great tunnel dug under the ground. And two teams digging at the same time, coming together and meeting each other underground under however many meters of limestone and only being one foot off. That is pretty amazing. Uh, Essentially, as the Assyrians come and encamp around Jerusalem, the reason that they were able to live is because of the water flowing through that tunnel. God will always make a way. God will always make a way, no matter how rough things seem to get, no matter how... 
uh, you know, encroaching the enemy is on your territory, God will always make a way. And this, uh, do you ever get like me, where it's like you go through something hard and you, you, you make it because the Lord your God is on your side, and then after you're on the other side, you're like, why did I even worry? Why did I worry? But then it'll come back again and you'll worry again and then you have to trust in the Lord and then you'll, he'll deliver you and then you'll be like, why did I even worry? Oh, well, I, I think that's true. I think that's what happens often is it's not just you, Ken. It's not just you. John said it's building your faith. Yeah. One brick at a time.